to Doc Emily Rousseau and to my co-masterants, it is my pleasure to present the flow of our report for the Black F evaluating the CDS program. To start with, we'll have the prayer to be led by Ms. Marilyn Pardilio, followed by the Pambansang Awit, Sugbuhim, and the Nagahim. We'll then have our welcome remarks to be led by Mrs. Crisadel Alferez, and then we'll have games, which is four picks, one word. Next is the presentation of reports. First topic is individual reporting by Mrs. Maria Teresa Yanda, followed by seminar workshop by Mrs. Marlene Canumon. Next is preparation of curriculum models by Ms. Eliza Marie Saison. Next is term report by yours truly, Ms. Mary Grace Sagaysay, and the educational tour by Mrs. Maria Rebecca Colindres. After that, we'll have an intermission number, uh, which is a dance presentation by us. And then the second part of our game. We'll then continue with the reporting. The next topic is midterm and final examination by Mr. Rizzi Silim. It is to be followed by internet surfing by Ms. Marilyn Pardilio. Next is preparation of instructional materials by Mrs. Julita Codelan. Demonstration teaching by Mr. Riden Bastismo. And curriculum program by Mrs. Crisadel Alferez. We'll then have our closing remarks by Mrs. Maria Teresa Yanda. And lastly is the sharing of insights or experiences. Good afternoon, everyone. My report is about individual reporting. Reporting is the process used to communicate knowledge and gain from assessing students' learning. The purpose of reporting is to provide relevant information about a student's progress to students, parents, support staffs, and other teachers. Reporting in the presenting of news in newspaper, or could be in radio and even on television. It should be an honest and impartial political reporting. It could be through journalism, writing, and presenting or in even newscasting. So let's have now the importance of reporting. Number one, for a decision-making tool. Today's complex business organization requires thousands of information. Reports provide the required information. A large number of important decisions in business or any other areas are taken on the basis of information presented in the report. Number two, for investigation. Whenever there is any problem, a committee or a commission or a study group investigate the problem to find out the reason behind the problem and the present and found output with, an, with or without the recommendation in the form of a report. Number three, for evaluation. A large-scale organization are engaged in multi-dimensional activities. It is not possible for a single top executive to keep a personal watch on what was others are doing. So, the executive depends on the report to evaluate the performance of various departments or units. Number four, for a quick location. There is no denying the fact that business executives need information for quick decision making. As top executives are found to be busy for various purposes, they need vital sources of information. Such a source can be the business report. Number five, development skills. It is a report a writing skill develops the power of designing, organizing, coordination, judgment, and communication. Therefore, such skill acts as a catalyst. Number six, neutral presentation of facts. Facts are required to be presented in a neutral way. Such presentation is ensured through a report as it investigates, explains, and evaluates, and much more about any fact independently. Number seven, professional advancement. This report also plays a major role in professional progress and advancement. For promotion to the rank and file position, satisfactory job performance is enough to help a person. But for promotion to high-level position, intellectual ability is highly required. Such ability can be expressed through the report submitted to higher authority. And number eight, proper control. 
Whether activities are happening according to plan or not, it's expressed through a report. So, controlling such activities are implemented based in the information of a report. And number nine, as a, ma as a managerial tool. Various reports make activities easy for the managers for planning, organizing, coordinating, motivating, and controlling. A manager may find help from a report which acts as a source of information. And number 10, encountering advanced and complex situation. In a large business organization, there is always some sort of a labor problem which may bring complex situations. To tackle those situations, managers take the help of a report. And now we have different kinds of reports. Number one, formal or informal reports. Number two, short or long reports. Number three, informal or analytical reports. Number four, proposal report. Number five, vertical or lateral reports. Number six, internal or external reports. And then number seven is periodic reports. Let's now have the details of the different reports. For number one, long and short reports. This kind of reports are quite clear. As the name suggests, a two-page report or sometimes referred to as a memorandum is a short. And a 30-page report is absolutely long. What makes a clear division of short reports or long reports? Well, usually notice that the longer reports are generally written in a formal manner. Number two, internal and external reports. As the name suggests, an internal report states that within a certain organization or a group of people. In the case of office settings, internal reports are for within the organization. We prepare external reports such as news reports in the newspaper about an incident or in the annual reports of companies for distribution outside or the organization. We will Then we call this all public reports. Number three, vertical and lateral reports. This is about the hierarchy of reports ultimate target. It is report is for your management or for your mentees. It's vertical report. Whether a direction or upward or downward comes into motion, we call it a vertical report. Lateral report, on the other hand, assists in coordination in the organization. A report traveling between units of the same organization level, such as reports among the administration and finance reports, it is called lateral reports. Number four, periodic reports. Periodic reports are sent out in a regular pre-scheduled date. In most cases, their direction is upward and serves as a management control. Some, like annual reports, is not vertical but it is a government mandated to be periodic in nature. That is why we have annual or quarterly or half-yearly reports. If they are this frequent, it only makes sense to preset the structure for this report and just to fill in the data of every period. That's exactly what happens in most cases too. Number five, formal and informal reports. Formal reports are meticulously structured and they focus on objectivity and organization, containing deeper details and in the writer must write them in a style that eliminates factors like personal pronouns. Informational reports are usually short messages with free-flowing, casual use of language. We generally describe the internal report or memorandum as an informal report. For example, a report among your peers or report for your small groups or team and others. Number six, informational and analytical reports. Informational reports such as attendee report, annual budget report, monthly financial report, and such carry objectives information from one area of an organization to maybe a larger system. Analytical, analytical report is a scientific research, feasibility report, and employee appraisals that shows an attempt to solve actual problems, and these analytical reports usually require suggestions at the end. Number seven, proposal reports. These are kinds of reports that are like an extension to the analytical problem-solving reports. A proposal is a document one prepares to describe how an organization can provide a solution to a problem they are facing. There are usually always a need to prepare a report in a business setup. The end goal is usually very solution-oriented. We call such kind of report as proposal reports. Number eight, which is the last one, is the functional report. 
It is a kind of report includes the marketing reports, financial reports, accounting reports, and a spectrum of other reports that provide a fiction specifically. By the large, we can include almost all reports in most of these categories. Furthermore, we can include these single reports as in several kinds of reports. That's all for now. This is Teresa Leanda reporting and good afternoon. My topic for today is about seminars and workshops. Seminars are frequently more lecture driven with less participants, interaction other than answering questions. At a workshop, handle the questions as they arise and often turn uh, them into a group discussion. Workshops are usually smaller, 25 people or less. Seminars are often over, uh, over 100 people. Attendance, these seminars will help create an effective learning environment, improve teaching learning situations, keep updated and modern instructional devices, and inspire. Importance of seminar workshop First, as we know, the confidence is very, uh, very important for everyone of each stage of life, which somewhere individual lack, lacks as he or she did not have many opportunities to speak in front of audience. So, by attending these types of seminars and conferences and interacting with the leaders of their field by presenting a poster in conference boasts up the confidence of a student which helped him or her during an interview. Networking is an important part of an individual life. In workshops, students and teachers from different institutions take part. Meeting new people and making new friends can help the students to take guidance and encourage new way of thinking. If a student wants to continue his or her career in scientific research, then Meeting people relate to it, relate to it, and deference and conferences can be very beneficial as there and many scientists who attend these conferences. Second, a student pursuing post graduation and want to do a doctoral can learn about the recent studies, going in respective fields, and can explore new areas of research which will help him or her to choose their topic for research and moreover they come to know about good laboratories and institutions that they would like to work in future by learning about new topics and meeting leaders in their field that student feels encouraged and motivated third Learning any prominent personality in seminar or workshop helps the student to gain information about their way of work or how things take place. It helps know about profession, professional institutions and learn new discoveries in their field. Presenting a poster in conference helps the students to gain soft skills which will be valuable, valuable in their academic career and poster making by a graduate or post-graduate. Students help them to explore at deeper level. Presenting a poster helps the student to build their skills that will be useful in future. One. My topic for this afternoon is all about the preparation of curriculum design model. First, what is a curriculum? According to our previous study, curriculum is a design plan for learning that requires the purposeful and proactive organization, sequencing, and management of the interaction among teachers, students, and the content knowledge we want to acquire. What is a curriculum model? 
A model is a format for curriculum design developed to meet the unique needs, context, and purpose in order to attain the goals of curriculum developers. There are two types of curriculum design model. First is subject-centered design model and learner design model. A subject-centered design model focuses on the content of the curriculum and corresponds to textbooks written for specific subjects. One of its components is the discipline design that focuses on the academic discipline often used in college but not in elementary and secondary levels. Next component is the correlation design that comes from a core correlated curriculum that links separate subject designs in order to reduce fragmentation. This means that subjects are related to one another but each subject maintains its identity. Next is the broad field design. A variation of the subject center design made to prevent compartmentalization of subjects and integrate the contents that are related to each other. Some curriculists who are subject-centered are Henry Morrison and William Harris. The next type of curriculum design model is the learner-centered design model. It's a learner-centered educative process and this emphasis is very strong in elementary levels. One of its components is the experience-centered design, where children remains the focus, the interests and the needs of the learners cannot be pre-planned, experiences are the starting point of the curriculum, and learners are made to choose from the various activities. Next component is the humanistic design. It, develop, it is a development of self and ultimate goal, positive self-concept and interpersonal skills, and integration of thinking, feeling, and doing. Some curriculists who are le learner-centered are Jen Dewey, Jean Jacques Russo, Pisa Luzi, and Troy Bell. Ralph Tyler introduced the four basic principles, or also known as the Tyler's Rational. Next, he also introduced the planning phase of the curriculum. This is the Tyler's model of curriculum development. His first objective is the setting objectives, which corresponds to the question, what educational purposes should the institu institution seek to attain? Next objective is the learning experiment and content that corresponds to the question, what educational experiences can be provided that are likely to attain this purpose? Next objective is the organizing learning experiences, which corresponds to the question, how can these educational experiences be effectively organized? And next, evaluation that corresponds to the question, how can we determine whether these purpose are being attained? Next, according to Ralph Tyler, his curriculum planning that society corresponds to resources that has subject matters that has focuses on objectives the same as the philosophy that corresponds to screens that will later on become an instructional objectives. Resources also includes learners the same as the psychological attributes that are included in screens. Then selection of learning experiences. Once the objectives are being selected, then organization of learning experiences happens that will lead to evaluation. And these are the things that are needed in curriculum design and curriculum evaluation. Next curriculist is Hilda Taba. She said that she believed that teachers should participate in developing the curriculum. She developed Tyler's model in her grassroots approach. She also introduced the seven steps in her grassroots model. This is the Taba's curriculum development model, which starts from evaluation that needs diagnosis, and once the needs are being diagnosed, then formulation happens. Next, after the selection of content, the organization and selection of learning content follows together with the organization of learning activities. These are the things that are 
subjected to evaluation, formulation, and organization that needs teachers' output. Next curriculum model was given by Galen Saylor and William Alexander. They view the curriculum development consisting of four steps. First is basis external variables that has goals, objectives, and domains that promulgates curriculum designing to curriculum implementation that leads to curriculum evaluation and feedback. And before I will end my report, I would like to leave you this quotation. A good curriculum can change the face and fate of a nation. That would be all. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My topic is about term report or term paper. So what is term paper? According to Wikipedia, a term paper is any type of research-intensive paper authored by students over the course of an academic term. This paper typically accounts for a large part of their final course grade. So term paper is a type of research-based assignment that a student has to submit at the end of the term. They are generally intended to describe an event, a concept, or argue a point. It also has to be unique, so plagiarism is a big no-no. This academic writing assignment must be well-written, analytical, organized, and well-researched since it plays a major role on the student's final grade. So next, term paper or research paper. What is the difference between the two? So since most students often confuse term paper and research paper, let's differentiate the two kinds of paper. So the first difference is the time frame. Term paper has to be submitted by the end of the term, while research paper needs months or even years to complete. So term paper, basically it can be done or can be finished in a few months since it's just a short kind of writing. While research paper, it requires a longer period of time. Next is the purpose. Term paper, it's the reflection of knowledge of a student on a particular topic. So it's usually a journal or reflection in relation to the topic. While research paper, its purpose is to find a viable solution to a problem. It tries to answer questions or solve societal issues. Next difference is that term paper is much simpler in nature and tries to support an existing thesis paper in most cases. While well, research paper has a hypothesis and it either supports the hypothesis or rejects it with a feasible data. Next, what are the factors that we have to consider when choosing a topic? First, the length. Considering the length will help you choose a certain topic because you will be able to decide how broad or narrow your subject will be. Usually, difficult and broad topics often leads to longer paper. Next, resources. So before choosing your final topic, make sure that you have a lot of references to support your study. Books, magazines, and the internet are your helping hand for this area. You can also use Google Scholar to look for related literature. Another thing is the complexity. So do not go for too complex topics if you think you can't explain it. The most important thing is for you to fully understand your study so that you'll be able to explain it well. You can also ask some experts if you have questions. Even your professor can help you for topics that you don't feel you fully grasp. So next is, how do we start a term paper? So first, clarification should be made with your instructor before doing any research or writing work. So if something is bothering you about your topic, you are free to ask questions from your professor. They can also help you clarify things and give some suggestions. Next, a good way to start is by creating a compelling and creative title. 
So title page is the first impression of your work. So make sure that it will capture your reader's attention. Another thing is if you want quality work and a high grade, plan ahead and make time every day for writing your assignment. So time management is a must. Always plan and follow the schedules you've made. Another thing is to allot some time for reading articles related to the topic. So now let's move on on making an outline. So the first part is the cover page. So the cover page contains your name, your course number, your teacher's name, and the date of the deadline in the center of the page. Next is the abstract. Usually it's less than a page long and then it describes your work. It lets the readers know where the term paper is headed, the issue at hand, and why the subject was interesting or important enough that you decided to write about it. Next is introduction. The introduction should begin with a statement of the topic to be discussed. Explain the significance of the topic or problem at hand and write about how you plan to discuss or resolve the issue. Another is the body. The body of your text should contain the main points from your research. Provide information about the topic so that the reader can further understand what is being discussed. Don't forget certain positions pertaining to the issue and the analysis of the research you have done. Next is the results. So you have to explain why your research has led you to believe certain things about your subject. How has your view changed from when you began the project? Has it stayed the same? And why? So tie everything you've been explaining into what you had stated in your introduction. Last one is the discussion. So you have to end with a summary and a conclusion about the topic in question. Finish by stating an opening question or by prompting the reader to continue his or her own research on the subject through a discussion. Now let's move on to the common mistakes in making a term paper. So the very first one is starting too late. You should always look ahead in your calendar and plan accordingly to avoid rushing with the clock. Second one is using first or second person. So we should avoid uh, we need to avoid using the words I, you, we, or they. Next is using construction. So do not shorten words. So like instead of using or writing don't, you should write do not. Or if you're going to write isn't, you have to write is not. Next is shifting verb tense. So make sure all your verbs are in the same tense. Another is putting more than one thought in a paragraph. So each paragraph should start with a topic sentence and each sentence in the paragraph should fall under the topic sentence. Next is not using transition. So do not jump. If one paragraph is about flowers and the next one is about slippers, then how did you get from flowers to slippers? So you have to explain it well. Next is irrelevant sentences or paragraphs. If it doesn't fit the umbrella of your study, do not put it in the paper just to make it longer. Another is lack of clarity. Don't beat around the bush. Say what needs to be said and be direct to the point. Next is using personal thoughts without the support of research. So per paper, this is not an opinion paper. So everything must be supported by research or other related studies that you can find in books or internet. And lastly is not giving credit. So plagiarism is a big crime. You must give credit to the author of all the quotes and ideas that aren't your own. So to sum things up, here are the things to remember when making a term paper. So first, choose a topic. Your title should be creative so that um, your readers, you can catch the attention of your readers. 
Next is to find resources. You have books and of course, the internet can help you. Next is you can start making an outline. And after making an outline, you can start writing your paper. So after you're, you're done writing everything, you know that there are grammatical errors, typo errors, so we should, we need to proofread and edit. And lastly, print the final copy. So that ends my report for the term paper. Thank you and good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. My report is all about educational tour. What is an educational tour? Educational tour is an immersive group touring experiences that students participate in a group. They engage, play, and learn along with the program in a practical and a more entertaining way. These experiential learning programs increase their overall learning experience by taking them to new places. What are the benefits of educational tour in the teaching learning process? Inside the classroom, a student gets to know about new things, new ideas, and new concepts. While outside the classroom, a student explores and experiences. There are various benefits of educational tours. As the teacher and philosopher Confucius famously quoted, I hear and I forget. I see and I remember. I do and I understand. The idea of educational tours is built around the practice of experiential learning. Okay. The benefits of educational tour. We have the number one, effective learning. Practical implementation of concepts is the most effective tool for learning. While classroom learning may give them an opportunity to apply their learning on hypothetical situations, an educational tour, on the other hand, makes students face real-life problems. Coming up with solutions makes them innovative thinkers. When learning is accompanied by fun, excitement, and enjoyment, it stops being burdensome and boring, and students learn as a part of their natural growing up process. Second benefit, exchange of ideas. An educational tour offers the perfect and formal setup for lively discussions. Group discussion is also one of the most effective tools of education. Students can have group discussions not only among their friends, classmates, and peers, but also with new people. This reignites their interest in studies. Real life experiences like educational tours to science museums, museums of history and arts, places of research, our factory visits are priceless as they make learning colorful and real. The third benefit of educational tour, we have personal development. An educational tour away from the comfort of school and home fosters independence, leadership skills, and communication skills. Students learn to break down the barriers of language and learn how to communicate across boundaries. An exchange of cultural values allows for them to become more accommodating personalities. The experience of travel makes them independent individuals and helps establish lifelong values and priorities. Travel also makes them strong individuals. The fourth one, it, enhan it enhances perspective. An educational tour to new places it's not just a fun getaway. It is about exploring new environments and cultures. One of the most important benefits of an educational tour is that it subtly develops an understanding of various social issues around the world. Okay, we have... Students get a better grip on the local and the global issues. They become more empathetic and respectful towards other cultures 
as well as towards their own surroundings. An educational travel empowers them with a new and enhanced perspective to look at things and develops them into considerate personalities well aware of the world issues at large and in depth. So we have another one, Global Networking. As students travel to different places, they interact with different people. Interacting with locals and other students on educational tours, develop amazing social skills and networks. University visits and school visits are particularly beneficial as students develop a family outside of their own comfort zones and extended network of contacts and references. They learn the norms of acceptable social behavior in different circumstances and learn to extend a hand of friendship to people from different cultures, socioeconomic backgrounds, and this develops the most sought-out people skills in them. This is how to organize an educational tour. First, decide on a destination. First, thing, first things first, you'll need to decide where you are going and why. For example, if you're teaching a history class, you may want to visit a historic village or a similar site. Teaching biology, perhaps a visit to a state park for a hike, and bird watching is in order. If you don't have any great ideas, Try asking your colleagues or even your students for suggestions. You are sure to get some good ideas. Second, ask your administrator's permission. You'll need to ask your principal or other administrator for permission. So make sure that you do so and follow their instructions and restrictions when arranging your field trip. And fill out all the proper request forms. Third is you have to arrange transportation. Transportation is an important part of a field trip. Typically, you will be taking a school bus to your destination. This is usually the cheapest and easiest way to get to a particular destination. So make sure you will fill out all the forms needed to request a bus so the transportation staff at your school can arrange things. However, in some cases, you may be able to take staff vehicles or have parents volunteer as drivers and chaperones. Think about what makes the most sense for you. Fourth is decide on a food plan. If there is an on-site cafeteria where you are going, make sure kids bring money for food. Alternatively, have them pack their own lunches. You may want to have some extra food in hand in case one of your students forgets lunch or else you will have a cranky student or a few on your hands. Next is plan your schedule for the day. Once you have decided where you are going, how you are getting there, and other basic logistics, it is time to plan your schedule when do students or pupils need to arrive at the school when are you departing when are you coming back what activities will you be doing for how long will they be any recreation or free time do you need to bring any tools or other supplies do your best to schedule everything perfectly with few gaps and avoid unexpected surprise. Next is you have to arrange supervision and volunteers. For older students, you or who are well behaved and responsible, you may not need any extra supervision. However, younger kids may need more supervision. So check with your administrator to bring a teacher's a teacher aid or two along you could also ask for parents to volunteer as chaperones as a rule you will want one adult for every 10 kids again this may depend on their age maturity and behavior 
Next is you have to create a permission slip. Now that you have planned out the basics of your trip, it is time to create a permission slip. You will need to get permission from the parents of your students so that they can go on on the trip. A basic permission slip consists of two parts. Two parts. Okay, the top part of the permission slip consists of information including where you are going, the purpose of the trip including the connection to your curriculum, a basic schedule when you are going, departure, pick-up times, contact information for you, the school, and any other relevant staff members. Information about what students need to wear and bring, including money, if applicable and necessary. Food arrangements and information. Transportation arrangement. A date by which the permission slip must be received for the child to go on the trip. The second part of the letter simply consists consists of a form where the parent or guardian can sign and date the slip and give their permission. Remind your students to bring back their forms. You don't want them to be left behind while the rest of you go out and make a day of it. Next, decide who is allowed to go. You may want to make the trip an incentive. For example, require good behavior from your students for a week before the trip. If you do this, you'll need to make arrangements for kids who are not allowed to attend, such as a study hall or a trip to the library, as well as adult supervision. Next is tie the trip into your curriculum. It is a good idea to have curriculum lessons that are directly related to your field trip in the days leading up to it. For example, you could have your students do some background reading on the place you are visiting and create in class activities that will tie in with the trip. Next, have a communication plan in a place. Or in the place before you leave you should have a plan to communicate with adults and parents of your students in case something goes wrong if weather delays the trip if your boss gets a flat tire if a student gets sick or has an allergic reaction and so forth and that's all for my report thank you